the Mike on Much podcast. I am your host, Mike Fearman, and I'm here with my friend and trusty producer sitting in my living room, Max Kerman. Max, what's going on? Well, it's a bit of a gloomy Sunday here, but uh, happy to be in your living room, which has sort of turned into an emporium of some sort. It doesn't seem like people live here, but they store stuff here. What, what is going on here? <laughs> uh, my wife, Danica, has started sort of on the side doing this, like, uh, she goes shopping for, like, vintage items, you know, mm-hmm. like cups or old plates. Or, cool looking stuff. Yeah, like kind of hip stuff. And then on Insta, like, she takes nice photographs of them and then posts them on Instagram for like a bit of a markup because she went out and find them and people come and they buy them. And she promotes it on Instagram? Yeah. Are you allowed to say what the Instagram account is called? It's called Can't Let Go Vintage, but it's basically only local in like Hamilton okay. and it's her and her sister doing it. But it's been like, because of this, my house now looks like an emporium for <laughs> old vintage stuff. Because you have this sweet house, but I like how, you know, some people really want to make their house like this beautiful space. And then there's other people who are just like, you know, all about the excitement of whatever their job is or yeah. their passion is. And the, the passion for this has uh, taken precedence over making the house look ballin' at the moment, <laughs> which is yeah. cool. I like that. I appreciate that. Yeah. As you, when you came in, you're like, what is all this stuff? Well, uh, when I, at the, at the front door, there's just bags sitting outside with little cards on them for like <laughs> random people, which I like the idea of random people just coming up, taking their bag and putting money in the box. Yeah. Actually, well, they slide it under the door a lot of the time too. So sometimes I'll just be sitting here like watching basketball and I'll just hear like money start sliding under the door. <laughs> it's a real trust system though. That's cool. Right. It is. Yeah. Honor system, bro. But yeah, she's really good at it and uh, I'm proud. But that's what's going on uh, with our house. It's become an emporium. Well, I like this idea of the trust or the honor system. I get such a thrill out of like leaving my computer somewhere in a public space and then just seeing what happens. Like if I have to go to the bathroom or have to go make a phone call. <laughs> you get a little rush. Like, will it be here when well, I get back? Because it always reaffirms my belief in that people are generally pretty good when it, it is there. Oh, sometimes I'll leave my bike outside unattended. Wow. And uh, and so, it, it, so it's a reaffirming thing. Because most of the time, I'm a real believer that if you get robbed, it's just bad luck. Because... Mm-hmm. It's a lot of times it's just like bad time, bad place. Most of the time, you know, we live in a pretty safe country, safe city. I mean, obviously there's people listening to the podcast who'd be like, my bike has been stolen nine times. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, it's funny. It's, it reminds me of that. Uh, I believe it was in Bowling for Columbine where Michael Moore came to Canada and oh, basically yeah. no one locked their doors. Yeah. Was his hypothesis, which is a bit of a, clearly we lock our doors, but I always thought that was such a funny, like kind of. A juxtaposition where like Canada's so safe and you know nobody even locks their doors. I don't like the idea of the arms races. If everybody just like didn't lock up anything, then it would be a little nicer. But um, but someone will always take advantage. Yeah. Do you lock your door? You know what? I didn't lock our doors for a long time, uh, but then we our house got robbed. <laughs> <laughs> now that I say that, see, I, this, if I have one talent, it's not really remembering the <laughs> shitty things. You know, some people like something bad happens to them and it stays with them for the rest of their life, and they're like skeptical people. And I, I totally understand that, but for whatever reason. I haven't really been born with that chip in me. Like um, You don't hold on to the bad things, only no, the good ones. I, I, yeah, so I kind of forgot that we got robbed. But anyway, we got robbed because someone ran in the side window. Yeah. And then walked out the front that one night when we were all in the house, too. It must have been 3 in the morning. And if I'm not mistaken, they took the laptop. They took the laptop. I forgot. <laughs> I think I think I might have told that story on the pod. Oh, you definitely did. Okay. So that's a little throwback. Yeah. But anyway. Anyway, Max, actually, just as you walked in, I was watching um, episode 4 of of a TV show called The Leftovers. Oh, yeah. Season three. So get this. Because we did the Bobby Cannavale, Terrence Winter interview for Vinyl, I got into like this pipeline, basically, where HBO sends me screeners now. Oh, sweet. So if I'm like doing like research or to talk about it on the pod, like I had the first three episodes of Girls before the show even aired for this last season. People are liking that season too, right? Well, here's the thing. So I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Like I'm going to watch all this stuff. I haven't at any time. Like, I haven't uh, even watched Girls this season yet. And I, I like Girls a lot, so I'm like, and I haven't had time. I love the show The Leftovers. Season two, I thought, was, like, phenomenal. The Leftovers, if you haven't watched, is the show on HBO. And the premise is essentially that, like, 2% of the world's population, like, I don't know how many millions, go dis- they disappear like this. It's called The Sudden Departure. And a lot of people, you know, religious people think it's the, you know, the rapture. Scientists are trying to sort of prove why it happened. And you never really find out what caused the sudden departure. Okay. It's how people deal with it. And the way that they perceive it or it's colored is obviously just it comes down to their disposition, what their belief system is. Oh, uh, interesting. But I mean, it's a pretty depressing show. But when I saw the trailer like three years ago, I was like, holy crap, what is this? I was like, Damon Lindelof, the guy did Lost. Yeah. I went out and bought the book. It's based on this book by Tom Parada. Okay. I blasted through it. Book was pretty, to be completely honest, underwhelming. Mm-hmm. 
first season, underwhelming, but a couple gems. Season two, they like got it right. Yeah. This is the final season. So they went in there like, we're only going to do one more season. This is it. Damon Lindelof, they literally, for critics and pod hosts alike, they dumped the first seven episodes of an eight episode season. Oh, wow. So I've been binging this on like my HBO thing, but with great power comes great responsibility because like my brother loves this show. Like uh. our buddy Jug loves this show. Like I could, like, if they, once they hear this pod, I feel like they're going to be like, dude, dude, dude. But the truth is, I'm. I would never give out the the portal and the password because I'd be terrified. Like the little screener has my name burned into it. Oh for viewing. yeah, you don't want to be that guy. I'm not messing around. No. But I will say that the season so far, uh, I'm on episode four, has been very intriguing. And is it a weekly show? Yep. Okay. I think it starts at the end of April. Nice. But I'm loving this uh, early access stuff on HBO. Yeah, yeah. Shouts to HBO. Thank you. So, uh, so Maxi, you just came in from Toronto. Yeah, I was taking care of some biz <laughs> in the big city. I uh, see my family. Uh, Friday though was kind of fun. Um, <laughs> we we got a note from our friend Shane, the pop culture aficionado on the show, who also works in your department and much music. And he said he needed a little help with the shoot. Uh, because they need to throw a party as part of this thing he's working on. The location was a frat house. It was a frat house at U of T, and it was a <laughs> legit frat house. Uh, one, of, one of our friends pointed out, because, um, you know, the frat houses were built as beautiful old houses and then were taken over as... By party animals. By party animal <laughs> dudes. And... And one of them was just like sitting in the frat house, just like looking at it, thinking, "Man, I wonder like how beautiful and special this place was before like it got taken over by a bunch of frat dudes." Yeah, what was the and then, and when they originally created it? Was it, did they ever think that the intent of this beautiful Victorian home would be for a bunch of guys to do keg stands? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, there's there's um, some controversy swirling though uh, at the party because part of the invitation was you know there's going to be beer there. Let's have a night in Toronto. It was sort of maybe in the mind of everybody who just heard the word frat house <laughs> and like party, party scene, it just turned into like, this is going to be like a raging party in Toronto. Sure. This and it's great. like, you know, we need bodies for this frat house scene. Uh, we're not going to pay anybody, but there'll be probably drinks there. Yeah. And if we're going to stay true to character <laughs> for the scene, we need to get <laughs> wasted, right? Method actors, man. Method actors. <laughs> So, so Dan, uh, our friend Dan, who who is like the most helpful guy in the world, like literally when it comes to a lot of Arkell stuff, he's like he helps me take care of guest lists for all of our friends. He's very task oriented. He's like the master organizer in a group. Yeah, and he and he doesn't get nearly enough credit for this. He like literally is the guy to pick up people at the airport. He's very generous. He puts like everything on his credit card. He's part of the Coachella boys. Like he takes control out of the situation, and he's amazing at it. So that being said, that being said, <laughs> however, but um, so he uh, he rounded up the troops. He he messaged a bunch of people he knew in Toronto. We got to the shoot, and uh, there was no beer there. <laughs> <laughs> And he he like never gets cranky, but he was getting so cranky at the shoot and was just sort of huffing and puffing. And like there was some like alcohol kind of kicking around and but everyone else was sort of just happy to be on set because you know, if you're you're not in the biz, being, you know, on set is kind of can be maybe an exciting thing. People are operating cameras, there's lights, there's people running around like trying to make this thing look like a real party. <laughs> and uh I said, It's like Dan, just like if you don't want to be here. Just go. There's like we're literally in the heart of Toronto. Just go find a bar or like run up the street and grab some booze and bring it here. Like who cares? And he's like, I pulled all the strings I had to get my friends here. People were taking their Friday off work just because I asked them to come here. I got a hotel in Toronto just for this night, and it's all being ruined right now. I was like, well, first of all, your favorite thing to do is to get a hotel in Toronto. We've literally done it the last three weekends. And just <laughs> it's just become about, par for the course. Yeah, it's literally been like. Our thing, we talk about how much we love getting hotel rooms and splitting it amongst four dudes. And when he's like texting all of his friends in Toronto, like four of them showed up, and that's great. <laughs> and I love them for showing up. But uh, it was it was awesome to see Dan ha have a moment of. Uh, he he actually texted me. Was there a storm out? At one point, I think he left. Mm, uh, that's what I'd heard. He did well because I then I said to Dan, I was like, I thought he had cooled off because he was he was kind of giving me the gears, and I said, Dan. How's it going, buddy? And he goes, 
It's terrible. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, I did get a very sweet text from him uh, the next day. Sorry for being an upset girlfriend last night. Regardless, it was a fun night. Hope it goes well today. So that's good. If there's one thing we can learn in this world is uh, is delivering a a heartfelt apology, timely apology can go a long way. I'm a big fan of just apologies. You know, some people just can't do apologies particularly well. Mm -hmm. And the last observation I'll make, and I think we all know this really, is that in our group of friends, you know, the average age is like 30 plus. We have one newer member of the group. Uh, we go, he, his real name is Taylor, but we call him Psycho. Mm-hmm. Can you give the background on the name Psycho T? <laughs> okay, so so <laughs> basically uh, this guy, uh, Taylor, who we hang out with, our friend Jug started dating this girl, and Taylor is her younger brother. Yeah. I don't know if our buddy Jug brought him in. As no, like, Jug is a surly asshole brother-in-law. <laughs> and so Julian, actually, oh, who, so who's Julian very nice him. about inviting people to things, would invite Taylor to come to stuff. So when Taylor, who is significantly younger than the rest of us, joined the gang, the Raptors had a player named Tyler Hansborough. Tyler Hansborough. <laughs> and his nickname is Psycho T. So once Taylor started hanging out with us, we were like, man, he looks exactly like Tyler Hansborough. So we took Tyler Hansborough's nickname and we started calling him Psycho Teen instead of Psycho T because yeah, he looked like a teen. Because he looked like a teen. Now, here's the thing. When we go out, because uh, when we go out dancing, because the Champagne Boys love to dance, I think in our minds, w- like each one of the Champagne Boys thinks they're like the hunkiest guy in the club. <laughs> <laughs> like, and we're older and we're confident. But if you were to put all of us in a line and and, and like in a random stranger, like had no idea who anybody was, or like we just look like old, haggard assholes. <laughs> <laughs> and Psycho T is actually by far the most impressive uh, one of us all because he looks he's like six foot three he's, he's young he's young he's, he's got like fresh he's got a fresh face he's got like no wrinkles or anything he's like you know he's tall and handsome but it's funny because in the group we just kind of make fun of him like he's kind of like the junior member he's like the junior member kids, and like you know. like and like like he's nothing <laughs> but really but then if we were to go out psycho t literally would be uh you know the the winning prize yeah hey man that's the circle of life baby that's the circle of life you, sometimes you just got to move over and let the kids have it yeah <laughs> let they like we're doing them a favor it's like really <laughs> that that that's just aging yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> i've made my choice because i had to <laughs> <laughs> all right maxi today on the show we have the band perry now the band perry is a country act and i think one of the mandates um uh, is, They're sh- not just a country act, yeah. Max, as people will learn in this interview. As people will learn in the country. But they started as a country act. They're from the heartland of America. And, you know, as a mandate on the show, I like to reach out to to acts that maybe don't necessarily get long-form interviews or maybe wouldn't necessarily get invited to be on Fresh Air or WTF, but still probably have a compelling story and, and are working in entertainment and making music. Now... I was just thinking about a story you told me about one of the comments on the Kings of Leon episodes. Yeah. Because anytime in the open here, if we've gone into politics, I'm usually not thinking about who the feature guest is and who the listeners might be, who like might be just checking it out because the band retweeted it or something like that. For context. For, so for context, give the context of this, why I'm bringing this up. In the Kings of Leon episode in particular, uh, Max, we talked a lot about Trump. I think Trump had sort of newly been elected. He yeah. might have tweeted some nutty stuff. And so we were talking about, which, you know, in the end, it's like, I thought in a somewhat respectful way, like more so just inquiries as to like, why do people vote this way or the people that support them? Anyway, yeah, we are not political pundits or experts. We are just sort of pontificating in the way that anybody who sort of is following the news might do that. Exactly. Yeah. So I guess someone really uh, who is a Kings of Leon fan who had listened to our pod left in the comments. His <laughs> name is Hero Zero. Commented, it's really great hearing liberal millionaires <laughs> complaining. Really fantastic. Also, congrats on 500 plus views. Killing guys. So much reach. So much influence. Crying cucks. You're all f- <laughs> And then I won't use the word that he used. Derogatory uh, word for uh, a gay, gay man. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. 
one, the fact that he thinks we're millionaires. <laughs> that, I like that. That is good. <laughs> Not even close. Uh, although the nut will be happy to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, finally, right? Yeah. I like that he took the shot at a review count. Hey, man, we're growing. We're trying to build. <laughs> we're trying our best. Getting there. As you said, it's like, that's the part that really hurt. <laughs> <laughs> the truth always does. Yeah. Um, so anyway. Someone had to explain to somebody uh, what, a, what a cuck was. Yeah, exactly. So just like, look it up if you'd like. Yeah, look it up. We had to. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, so that all being said, I'd like to take this opportunity just for a moment uh, to talk about Donald Trump's la- latest week. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's been a crazy time in American politics. But this is good. We were recording this on a Sunday. It's going to literally come out tomorrow. And so this is the week, the week that just passed. Donald Trump's, oh, the Republican health care plan did fell, not, apart. fell apart. They, and they didn't even put it to a vote because they didn't have the votes and they knew it, so they pulled it off the table. Yeah, and uh, also there's all these investigations into uh, the Russia connections. Oh, yeah. There's uh, a rumor currently that Michael Flynn, the former national security advisor, might flip and that he's working with the FBI. Have you read any of this? No. This is what everybody's losing their mind about over the last 24 hours. Okay, to what I would tell us. Can you just tell it to me real quick? Essentially, like a, a, CNN, like a Harvard uh, professor, CNN analyst, had said that talking to her um, different sources, okay. they're saying that the reason Mike, Michael Flynn has like sort of basically gone underground is because the FBI has been able to flip him. And his <sighs> spokesperson said no comment to that question. Oh, and, wow. Uh, so, now... My favorite part about all this, and I use the word calamity because it's truly a calamity. It's like it is such a ragtag operation that the Trump office runs. And so, you know, he's been golfing all the time. Like, I've, I've like, and he was killing Obama for like going on the occasional golf trip. And he, he's been on like nine golf trips already. Like, yeah. every weekend he's golfing. And the funniest part is that. I don't know if like the Secret Service is just being relaxed around them or just like protocol just isn't in place. But there's like pictures today. The White House said that he's taking meetings all afternoon, and then random people are taking social media photos of him at the golf course. There's somebody <laughs> who took a social media of like Trump watching the golf network around a table. <laughs> it was just like there's been. I mean, I don't think that maybe those pictures could be fake, but they don't look fake to me. And well, the hypocrisy of how critical he was of Obama or anybody. It's like in government, it's like if I get in there, I won't have time to golf. I'll run a tight ship. I don't have time. And it's just yeah. like you're bullshitter, yeah. and you don't care. No. And that's fine, but I mean, I just, I wonder if people will equate those two and like he'll ever be held accountable for the line. Yeah, it's a good Or qu- misrepresentation. Yeah. Jeez, yeah, I know. It's, it's one of those questions because the country's so partisan. Anyway, uh, the we'll band s- Perry. The band Perry. <laughs> so we've, we've, siblings. A- we've alienated uh, some of their fans some potentially. Their fans, well, this is the interesting thing is they're kind of in a thing where this next album. Um, is moving a bit away from country. And that's kind of controversial, I think, for fans that have been with them for the first couple albums. Um, it's two brothers and a sister. Family dynamic. F- family dynamic. Uh, who are, you know, I think, trying something a little bit different, which I said in the interview I think is kind of commendable because I think that the the more secure path would be to keep making country records, mm-hmm. you know? But if their muse is bringing them in a different uh, realm where they want to, you know, uh, delve into pop music and something a little more mainstream, uh, then that's the prerogative, but at the risk of losing some fans. Mm-hmm. And we touched on a lot of that. Well, well, I haven't heard this yet, but uh, we appreciate that they came on the show and shared their, uh, their story. Yeah, you want to get to the interview? Let's do it. So, you guys, uh, you've been good? You said you early morning? Early yes. morning, yeah. Well, we played at the Mod Club um, last night, and so this morning, wake up call was at three forty-five. Uh, I got up at three forty. Oh man! Wow, it's tough. Yeah, you guys performed this morning too, right? We did. Yeah, yeah. We sure did. Yeah, so we had to at least be up for what, like five hours before we actually before sang. It takes our voices that long to wake up. I, I always wonder, like, whenever people are doing those morning shows, if it's just like, is it hard to bring the energy? Is it like? How do you get yourself, your mind, your head into a mind space where it's like a, you know, any other show at the normal time you would regularly perform? I think it's a different spirit, the morning shows. What were you going to say, Neil? Well, no, I just feel like, you know, I don't know about other artists, but I feel like when the three of us just get on stage, something just like kicks in and we just go into like, okay, we're in performance and we need to, you know, step up. But it, it really feels that way any time of the day, to be honest well, with you. Well, to me, it's more, we got to be on autopilot in the morning, you know, um, but usually we haven't even gone to bed that many hours before, so maybe it's just like this. We're still away. Yeah, just like layover from the night yeah. before or something. Right, but so that's why you get all those reps in, so that you're able to yeah. sort of turn it on yeah, 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 yeah. when sure. you need to. Um, I want to talk about, I watched your performance on Fallon, which was visually really interesting, just because I think a lot of people don't, I think, go into those things and yeah. and... 
is that something you guys planned? Did you work with a choreographer? And, and you know, what was your thinking going into that? Like, we want to make an impression. We want it to be something special. Definitely. You n- yeah, and, you know, we wanted to, obviously, you know, the song being Stay in the Dark, wanted to do something with light and dark. Um, and weren't, you know you know, keen and just having just a normal lighting rigs. And we love dance just for what it is. So we actually got these 10 dancers um, who were our lights slash dancers. And so we brought them in and spent about two days rehearsing with them uh, to create this, yeah, really visual performance just because a lot of times for us, you know, now that we've, you know, uh, you know, made this huge change over the past couple months, you know, we really wanted to play with like all the colors and, you know, all the different crayons in the box. And so we wanted to kind of make the Fallon performance, which was the first time we played mm-hmm. Stay in the Dark on, you know, TV, kind of make that a memorable moment for us and for everyone else watching. How are the, like, I mean, when you go to them, you're like, we want to try something new. Are they open to that? Are they kind of Oh, like, they were eh. amazing. Yeah. yeah, Fallon's folks especially, I think they were, he, he super loved the performance because it was actually our first time to do Fallon. And so yeah. we also just really wanted to, you know, bring him the best of what we could possibly create. And um, the name of our album is going to be My Bad Imagination. And so it almost like sets this bar for us every time we do a performance. You know, it's got to actually step up to being as imaginative as possible. And uh, and then Questlove was playing drums, which was How, so how's that happen? That was sick. That was cool. We just invited. Sick. We were like, yeah. will you play with us? <laughs> you know? He was like, sure. And check yes or no. And, uh, and he checked, checked yes. yes. And it was just so cool. How many know? rehearsals does he sit in on? Do you go through oh, it man, once, it was just twice? Like three times, like a, like a sound check. Yeah, yeah I mean, he's, he's like an amazing drummer, as everyone knows. Of course he is. But, yeah, it was, like, so easy. He just came in for, like, three rehearsals. It was great. And then we, later on that day, did it. He's a total pro. Just nailed it. Total. Yeah. yeah. It's good to be Questlove. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we've had a, a few bands on, like Echo Smith, which is a family yeah. band. Mm-hmm. I was in a band uh, with my brother, and I'm always interested in sort of the dynamics in family mm-hmm. bands. I'm sure you guys get this a lot. But more specifically, sort of how do you guys divide sort of like the aspects of your band like who you know is it songwriting between all three of you artwork business yeah. social media right. is that something that you oh, sort we of break definitely off? have yeah. roles yeah. i think in the writing room it's all pretty equal you know we're all just sort of sitting in there making song soup and throwing in <laughs> ideas how contentious does that get though not it's contentious not really unless okay the only time it does i do have this list of like i will never sing mm. this word this word it's usually like rainbow or clouds and so we just That's she, has a, she has a no-no list so if they have a lyric <laughs> idea and it has one of those you know words rainbows or clowns maybe I, feel like I get a little production is more contentious than actual the writing of the song itself yeah we agree on most of the musical yeah. stuff. If I'm being honest with you, it's yeah. usually the stuff that doesn't matter as much that we argue about. And we definitely but. divvy up like who's responsible for different things, yeah. but we all definitely want our say well, so Neil, in how it all happens. Neil would be more in charge of social media, mm-hmm. and he's the baby in the family. And I feel like <laughs> I don't know, Mr. Personality, it's you do a lot of that. And he also is the really visual one of the three of us. So uh, right now we're doing these pop up shows, and there's also a pop up shop component. So Neil's been the most actively involved on like the designs and really getting in the nitty gritty on that Reed is our business mind. The numbers, uh, he dude. Ma- he watches the money that we spend, <laughs> or more if he's watching it, what, what we don't spend. Um, and that's really kind of like the brain that yeah. you bring to it. And then I'm just making sure things like every night, the set lists are what they need to be. And, you know, Rehearsals. making the record, like making sure that the album details get buttoned up and yeah. that sort of thing. And everybody feels comfortable. And there was like, would you ever say, you know, design some artwork or, or a T-shirt? And then you guys would be like, we're not feeling that. Oh, we get approval. Oh, oh right. yeah. Yeah. It's still like, yeah, we each like focus on certain areas, but it's still like you bring what you've worked on to the group and then get feedback and then go back. You're and basically keep, keep responsible for keeping the ball rolling. That's yeah. kind of how we yeah. divvy it up. Oh, got you. Have you ever been like, I'm pushing this design through? Like, mm-hmm. There are moments, yeah, where we each like have an opinion about something where it's so strong. Like the others are like, okay, if you really feel that way, then we'll, we'll try it. But I feel like That's you rare, end though. up getting the role because you care more about it than the other two or yeah. something. And so I think if somebody has a really strong opinion and it's sort of the thing that they're driving, the other two of us will sort of be like, well, that's probably more important to you than it is us. So then we'll a- accommodate that. Right. Usually. If, if We've you're more grown a lot, guys. Right? We've yeah. matured. That's good. In the early days, we just like arm wrestled over everything. Yeah, yeah. Paper, rock, <laughs> That's how you solve the issues. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm a somewhat sort of casual observer when it comes to country music, and I always find it interesting, you know, when country artists shift toward the pop world. Mm -hmm. um, in reading about this record, there's been an ongoing sort of narrative that this is a move into new territory for the band. Can you describe to a layman like myself mm -hmm. why the country music community is sensitive to this idea and why it's such a compelling, compelling piece of your story? Well, I think that we're trying to discover that as well because, um, you know, even though we have put out two records in the country marketplace, we've always loved so many different styles of music. In fact, um, If I Die Young, which was the song that introduced us to the music world at large, um, was a happy accident in the sense that um, it came in this moment where we were recording an independent rock album. We grew up on the Stones and Led Zeppelin, and um, so we had spent two weeks in the studio and cut this record, and the very last night of the two-week stint is when we wrote If I Die Young, and it sounded totally different than everything else that we had just made. And so we knew that it was a special moment that we needed to follow. And so what we found over the years is those really magical music moments that come out of nowhere are things that we need to follow. And so back to your question about the country music fan base, I think country music is a lifestyle genre. I think um, you're writing songs from a place of, you know, what small town culture looks like. I think because country music is identifying somebody's lifestyle, if you step away from that or evolve away from that, they feel like it's a little bit of a personal insult. Um, insult. And that would never be what we're trying to do because we've never been the poster children for country music visually or um, lifestyle. What we've always related to in country is the spirit of that, which is honesty, sings a lot about where you've come from. Authenticity. Um, authenticity. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what we take from that genre and hopefully what we've brought to it over the yeah, years. Yeah, and I think for a genre who prides itself in honesty, we took that as, you know, whenever we decided to announce what we were going to do, especially with my bad imagination, we were just completely upfront about it. Because for us, that is the best way to kind of just explain, of you know, why you're doing something or what your direction is, you know, because I feel like a lot of times um, the country genre just they don't want to be, you know, either misled or felt like that they just weren't told the yeah. truth. So that was always even in our process just why we ended up, you know, Very posting important. on Facebook, you know, what our next move to was clarify, because if I'm being honest with you yeah. I think genres are ridiculous mm -hmm. anyways right because like, everyone listens to everything. everything artists are inspired by a plethora of everything. music it just matters yeah. what radio station it's yeah and so it, that's really sort of the nerdy part of the conversation if you're defining pop versus country it's wow. what station's gonna play <laughs> the song you know how did you find yourselves like you say you grew up on the stones and sort of mm -hmm. more rock how did you find yourselves in the country genre to begin with? So we grew up in Alabama um, and we were writing a lot out of Nashville. Um, that's actually where we had recorded that indie yeah. rock record. And so when we wrote If I Die Young and as we were listening to it and playing it for our friends in Nashville, it just was a very um, crystal clear moment that we needed to build an album around that central core song. And, and so sound. we did. And um, so we continued to write around it and really lift If I Die Young up. That's what we've always done with albums. Like, where's the core? Where's the heartbeat of this album sonically? What's the song that should typify this record? Mm. And then we sort of adjust everything around that. We definitely Definitely follow the lead of the song, if you will. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, Dolly and Cash sort of mm -hmm. being more socially conscious in their lyrics. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, like it's obviously a very politicized time right now, yeah. I think, yeah. down in the States um, and the world, really. How do you guys navigate politics in your music and I guess social media messaging? Is it is it something you're conscious of? Is it something like, no, the lyrics speak for themselves? How do you guys view that and sort of your role as artists with the platform? Well, you know, I feel like we definitely view our music as something that hopefully our, we're striving to bring people together. Sure. Again, there are a lot of really important conversations going on in the world, and it's all really, too, about identity and being very true to that mm -hmm. and being a voice for that. And so I guess if we dance anywhere politically, it would be to be your most authentic self. That's really the mission and the message of this new album um, because that's really what we've had to look in the mirror and mm -hmm. ask ourselves the tough questions you know are we going to make music based on what we've done before or are we going to make music based on where we're at in 2017 as Kimberly Reed and Neil or and music so, based on what other people expect of us yeah. you know too that's that's not right either it's whatever 
in this life is going to make you happy. That's what you need to follow. Yeah. Is it a concern? I mean, I think like our truest artistic selves would always want to just make whatever music you want. But I think fans are consideration or maybe like the proper move. Do you weight that at all? I think we sure. definitely keep our fans in consideration, but I almost feel like I'm a fan of artists because I'm curious to know what they're going to do next, right? Yeah. So fans, you really have to almost subdivide that and go, a fan is a fan is a fan yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Yeah. We may have fans that come in and out for a song at a time. For instance, If I Die Young had a very different fan base than a song like Chainsaw, which we yeah. put out on the radio. Um, but fans of the band Perry have grown to know that the only thing that they can expect of us is that we're going to do something unexpected. Sure. Um, so I think you know we consider them in the sense that we owe them authenticity, and we owe them uh, the romance of not knowing what's coming next. We want fans of the band specifically, not yeah. necessarily fans of a moment you know well i think it's more commendable to, i think the easy thing would be to stay you know in a genre where you just felt like that was the safe play and i think it's more commendable to follow sort of where you think your artistic you know muse is going Definitely. Well, and I think, you know, it's funny because I think the most freak out moment is when we do something crazy to our hair, you know, which we have also done. Like, seriously. Do, you, do you get a lot of comments? Because oh, you look very different than you oh, have Oh, jeez. Those blonde curls. <laughs> you know, some people miss them. Some people are glad that we're here. And um, again, I think it's about just doing what makes your heart happy. Um, you know, but with the music, we have even included some banjos on this record. I think everybody who hears the actual songs go, oh, well, this is still your perspective it's just an updated version of it and so we just never wanted to include a sound like a banjo because it would make it more country or exclude it because it would make it less country it's just all about having these gut right. checks whatever works creatively to go do we is this on here because we love it or is it on here because somebody else is going to love it i was asking why why yeah. is this going yeah, yeah. And, you know for us you know the questions you know we kind of have to you know start moving you know asking ourselves is, you know is it cool like again like can we said are we just doing this because we feel like we have to or is it because we really like it and you know the whole move and transition was a very honest reason because because we started like hearing songs either at shows or in public and specifically the production that just made us feel like good and like we had fun at it even if we didn't know the song there were just certain you know certain sounds that just made us happy and we wanted those on our record and so it wasn't like this conscious decision oh let's just do this for you know either business reasons or because we couldn't even write the same sort of songs we wanted to i feel like the the lyric and melody and songwriting has been pretty consistent it's just really a matter of what sounds make us the happiest and what we're into at the moment i feel like big beats and 808s are where our hearts are at so right currently <laughs> uh benny Cass produced this album? Yeah. yeah. He produced a lot of it. Yeah, we've had several different producers. Um, Benny is actually a producer that we met. He's like from uh, from Kanye's yeah, uh, production John camp. Kanye's. Yeah, amazing. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, John Bellion uh, produced a track called Best One Yet. Um, he, of course, has a big hit. Um, down in the States, low, maybe low, 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 low. Do you know low. that song? Uh, no. All time low, you need check to check it out. Check it out. is amazing. And then Jeff Basker also produced a track for us, which has been a long time dream yeah. of ours. We're so excited to work with him. You've worked with Rick Rubin in the past. We have. Yeah. 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 What are some contrasts between Benny and Rick and their their working styles and they're how they total lifted different you guys? Because Benny is a fairly young producer, uh, and Rick Rubin is obviously like a the guru of right. all producers. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a very different. Uh, experience kind of apples and oranges but, but they're minimalist but like yeah. in a very different different Capacity. way and different vibe and everything mm -hmm. yeah I guess going back a bit to sort of the beginnings of music and, and just sort of performing is it something that all three you knew you wanted to that you were sort of inclined to that you had this sort of need to get up on stage or was it maybe one of you leading the charge and then the other siblings being like yeah that seems like something kind of cool I Shit. think we all were really hungry for it mm -hmm. you know and it's funny we've always rearranged our entire lives around our music whether back in the early days that meant you know making decisions about do we go to college or do we not go to college this tough is tough choice totally yeah. and uh, there were moments when one of us would be like do we need a backup plan do we need plan b and uh, that's where our parents actually came in and said you know if you have a plan b you're going to fall back on it so let's rearrange your life to make music the number one focus and figure out how to make it uh foolproof which means spending 12 to 13 hours on it every day <laughs> yeah. you know and so uh whether we rearrange life then or as we're rearranging life and hairstyles now around it it's <laughs> always sort of been the one consistent in our life for all three of us how long was the stretch of uncertainty 
uncertainty where it was like, oh, maybe we should have thought about a b- backup. Like, when did you start seeing success after, say, the start of oh. the work? Oh, wow. Ten years after wow. the start of the work. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it was like Neil was eight at our first show. Reed was 10. I was 15. Um, but we didn't get our record deal to at least like six years after that or something. And I think maybe a little more. People will hear more. that and they go, oh, maybe they're more. so young. But when you're doing it and you're performing, it seems like such a long time, even though, you know, yeah. 25, if it's 10 years after 15, yeah. still yeah. seems young. But when you're in it, I don't think it does. You know, a decade yeah. with ups and downs. and For sure. For sure. You know, I, it just it takes a lot of work. You know, it, it is fun. And what people see, it is fun. We love being on stage, having sing-alongs. But it is also, you know, it's a job. It's a craft that you have to work on and hone a lot. And uh, a lot of people see our three faces on the record covers, see us, you know, on, on the TV and stuff. But it's a whole group of people behind us who make this happen. Even today with us, we have a team of people who, you know, have left their families to come out here on the road and, and just continue to push the dream. So we're really grateful. But, uh, yeah, it's fun. It's a fun, fun job. Was there a moment where there was, you know, faith was waning before you you had a a break or start to see success? Sure. I mean, I think that's why there's three of us, which is really a great thing, because it's like two of us are always going to be strong in a moment. And one of us could have a weakness. Um, You know, I know I remember conversations like if this doesn't happen in exactly six months from just hypothetically, (laughs) we should do something else. And then the other like, oh, this will happen when it's meant to be. You know, I'm just a really big believer that we're all here to do something very specific and of course there are going to be challenges separating, you know, the realization of that from the very, you know, be- the beginning line. Yeah. And so um, we've always been there to sort of support each other emotionally, have each other's backs. Never doubted the direction, though. I feel like that's the one, like yeah. sometimes yeah. doubted, you know, either the timeline or the process. But I feel like we all, maybe we were a little bit naive, but that kind of is our job. Yeah. Um, but I feel like that we never, we always looked at each other when there was a little bit, wait, is this the right direction? We always would just kind of say, yeah, yeah. I mean, we kind of believe it is. Yeah. Um, lastly, are you guys big planners? You know, I, I mean, I guess I want to know, like, how far do you think down the road, you know, for the man Perry and like, what do you see for the future? Or are you guys just like, no, this record, we got to figure this out, you know, the pop-ups mm-hmm. tour, yeah. whatever the process is, or are you thinking, what does the next decade look like? I think mm-hmm. we're actually, we are planners more than planners. We're dreamers. You know, we always imagine where in 18 months from now, uh, our music can be and our lives can be. But then we also are really trying to get better at being in the moment as well. And, um, really not, uh, forsaking, um, the real, like, joy of the moment for what we want to happen right. in 18 months. Cause it's, it's really hard. And you know, as we've gone through this process of being artists and having songs on the radio, we've talked to others, uh, other artists who've been around longer than we have. And that's the, like the one consistent thing they've told us is make sure y'all like enjoy the little wins and the, and the moments along the way because they go by so quick before you know it. But we definitely have a picture in our mind where each album can take us, you know, and so we, we have big, uh, big ideals for my bad imagination. We'll see what happens, I guess, in 18 months from now. Do you think music will always be something you do exclusively together as a family? Or do you think that you'll all branch out and do other things? I think if we're make, as we make yeah. music, yes. Yeah. I know that we all have even uh, individual things that we would love to do creatively or like, um, you know, as creative directors, even in different capacities. Neil's very like visual. Um, he actually is designing his own like fashion line and I would not be gifted with that. So I think we have different creative ventures that we're into (laughs) but um, we're all builders i mean that is like what we do i mean we love music but like more yeah we just like making stuff um and again whether that's music or you know fashion lines or whatever so i feel like in one form or the other they'll always be like you know whether or not we get each other's opinions on different things or whatnot yeah that'll always (laughs) remain you know that'll always probably remain a constant for us you'll always be creating for sure Yeah. yeah absolutely thanks so much for your time guys Welcome to the dessert. We are here with our friend and pop culture aficionado, Shane Cunningham. Shane, how's it going? Hey, uh, it's kind of crazy times right now. So you're I'm, very busy. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because I guess when a lot of stuff's going on, most people get excited or happy, but I kind of get like I don't know, complacent or something, or like stressed out and makes me kind of in a bit of a malaise. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Like I'm always thinking right now. Like constantly, like the whole time we, we just did a Facebook Live, 
the whole time I was just thinking about our project, our secret project our, we're doing together. Yeah, well, we can't talk about it yet. But. Right. Can I mention that I met? No, we're going to have to cut that. <laughs> no, okay. We can I'll bleep, bleep out the name. Yeah, yeah, yeah that would yeah. be intriguing. Yeah. Great. Love it. But, like, if I got to meet this person maybe um, years ago, I would have been super excited, right? But I was just like, oh, f I got to use my lunch break, sneak out, shoot this person. And it was just, it just creates a lot of um, anxiety. Like, so many things going on. Like, we're going to Coachella. Like, I don't even know one artist going at Coachella. I feel like everything's going so fast right now. It's hard. And, like, I just was at... Uh, Prince Edward County went on this road trip for Alex's birthday. It was your wife's birthday, birthday, so you took her on like a trip. Right, for her but birthday. the whole time I'm just thinking about everything coming up and how I'm going to squeeze all this stuff in, like shoots for work or shoots for here, and how to, how to like manage time. And so it's tricky. And like uh, you know, Jug had a kid. One of our Champagne Boys had a kid, and I can't go even celebrate or whatever, say hi to him or whatever. So been a little bit uh, stressed out. But one thing that has brought me a little bit of joy. I started using Tinder again. <laughs> <laughs> what? So it's kind of, uh, yeah. <laughs> Does your wife know? Yes, she's helping me on it. Uh, <laughs> but what happened is my sister was having some problems and she's not good at Tinder. And Like I'm, boy problems? Boy problems. And I'm very good at Tinder. Like, I'd say it's my best talent of anything I've ever been good at. <laughs> Tinder's, like, the one thing I have a natural <laughs> intuition for. And I'm just good at, like, going on, like, setting up dates and stuff. I don't know why. I just am good at that. So You're quick-witted. You're, you're comfortable texting. You're, you're funny wordsmith, I'd say. That makes sense. Yeah, I guess. And I get so, uh, you know when you really want something, your brain just works better for you. Your brain's just like firing off better yeah. jokes. Like I'm better on Tinder than I am in real life. Okay. Or when I'm texting the in the Champagne Boys message group. Yeah. Because I don't really care. When I care, I'm very like sharp. So I told my sister I would help her out. And her main problem is she was saying that guys they just want to kind of Netflix and chill these days. Okay, I'm sure. I'm like, oh, not the guys I'm going to get you. Like, I don't <laughs> tolerate that. <laughs> because, And honestly, like when I was on it as a guy, uh, I would always go on. To Netflix and chill. No, no. I would always go on a date. Because uh, okay. I just like it. It's more fun. It's easier to get to know them. Sometimes I would do a Netflix and chill. But for the most part, <laughs> that's if the girl was really pushing for it. But I would like to say, like, hey, let's go for dinner, have a drink. And as a girl on Tinder, I expect the same. Like, I want to set up. You want to be treated with respect. Right. And what my sister didn't realize is that when a guy's like, hey, uh, what do you want for breakfast? You just kind of say like, oh, shut up, you. And then, <laughs> and then you kind of like fire back and say like, how about we go somewhere nice or something like that? Then they'll actually respect you more. And it's, it's pretty interesting because... I'm talking to guys that I actually know. Like, <laughs> like this is outrageous. And I'm You're catfishing potential dates for your sister. No, but she actually goes on the dates. But, but, but I show up in a wig. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. You're selling a false bill of goods, though. No, I'm not. They're not getting her, though. Your no. witty repartee is not her. I know, but I send her the witty repartee, and then she adopts it and knows the conversation history kind of and she's pretty good at like does she have, any, does she have any access to her own account yes okay that's good so she kind of reviews it and and she's down with it and and i kind of split the difference between my and my sister's personality yeah and but i'm talking to uh some people that are tv personalities <laughs> and some of them can I you get, name names i can't stop it you're right <laughs> how did you know that that's I just crazy. threw it out. I was like, who would be Okay, on? you got to beep that. But Mike just <laughs> nailed who I was talking to. Um, not sexually, but like he, <laughs> he got the answer. And yeah, so I really wanted to set this up. I'm Because I'm, I'm just curious. So I'm kind of like interviewing this person. And he loves my sister. But my sister doesn't like him. Mm. What? I know. So I kind of set up the date. And she... Let him down, and I was really disappointed. And some, like you actually do, it sounds weird or gay or whatever, but you do build a relationship with some of these guys, and you really start liking them. And when <laughs> Tiff turns down, it's like, we like that guy. Oh, he's a good guy. And because Tiff goes for sometimes the guys that are shirtless in the, the pics. Oh, she wants the abs. 
And it's just not a good guy, typically. Yeah, you don't want to date that guy. Yeah, so I'm... So a guy that's shirtless on Tinder is usually not a good guy. Right. I like a guy who's in shape, but not too buff (laughs) where where it's embarrassing. You you know what I mean? If you have too many abs, you're too narcissistic. Or So I, I get a guy who just has, like, average shape. I don't want a fat guy. I don't want a guy who's ripped. I want a guy who's nice. I don't want a cocky guy. I want a guy who's funny, but not mean spirited. And so I've set up uh, a bunch of dates and it seems like she's enjoying herself and she's actually for the first time gone out on dinners and had the person pay. Wow. And that has never, she's been on all these dates and never had that. Wow. So that's, uh, yeah, but that's been kind of like, um, have you guys been on a date where someone's paid? No, but I don't think that's a social norm. Like, you, you know, the girls always do, like, the fake, they'll pretend like they're looking for the wallet. And then you're like, no, 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 I got it. And the, you find out they didn't even have a wallet. Or you know, like, but yeah, it's, it's just a so, social norm, right? Like, right. The, like, have you ever let a girl pay? I haven't. No, but yeah. I, well, no, I mean, now my wife pays. Like, now we, like, she, the reason I love Danica is because she literally would pay. Makes one, more money than you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, once we became, like, a, a legit couple, like, she paid half the time like mm-hmm. she would go out she'd be like no i'm getting this one yeah yeah off the you know it's fun. it's a good conversation piece because as much as like you know we're in 2017 equal rights like chivalry maybe should be dead for a lot of reasons and as much as i believe in that there is something interesting about i if i were to go on a date if i were single it'd be weird to like split the bill on the mm-hmm. first time there's still and i think the i think the woman would also maybe i mean i should speak for all women but um would I think there is an expectation that you'd be judged? Like, yeah, you just yeah. yeah. May, and, and I'm sure there are women out there listening that go. F- that I would totally pay. That's a social convention that we haven't quite got past. And what didn't we have this uh, NBA player thing? So yeah. there's been an, uh, there was a big article put out yesterday on ESPN.com where they talked about how wins on the road are up. So home home court advantage used to be a major thing in the 80s and 90s. And essentially the theory is the reason that teams would lose on the road is because they would get into a city and they would go out going clubbing, trying to find women, Mm -hmm. drinking, all that stuff. So then they would play like crap when the game time would come in the city that they're visiting. The theory in this article is basically players don't drink anymore because they take their job seriously, they take their body seriously, they take their health seriously. They so sleep like, seriously. They sleep seriously. Yeah. So there's like a stigma to drinking. It's almost like, oh, don't you take your job seriously, bro? Yeah. Um, and if they want to get, uh, if they want to have relations with a woman, they just go on Tinder. So basically, it's called the Tinderization of the NBA. Meaning, if like you're James Harden and you're single and you get into Toronto, you can hit up. Uh, Tinder or Instagram and DM somebody and have them waiting at the hotel as opposed to in the past You'd have to go to the club and you'd be drinking and you'd be waiting around to like meet somebody You think a lot of girls would be screen grabbing and using that evidence like maybe it happens more and it just doesn't get reported Like in the mainstream media that, that feels like that's something that like I, I, Obviously there's maybe some sports blogs that might post something that is mildly embarrassing But for like the ESPNs of the world and the Toronto stars like no one's gonna be writing columns about that Yeah, I do find though uh when you're single now, you're almost busier on Tinder if you're on these dating apps than if you're in a relationship. Like you have actually have less time to go out because you're so, at least I was, preoccupied with it. And now I'm kind of back in that world now where I'm like, <laughs> any free time Tinder. I'm on Tinder, yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's all. That's our episode. Thank you so much for listening. You can find us at Mike on Much on Instagram and Twitter. Yeah, if you could do us a huge favor and leave a comment in the ratings of the iTunes section, it helps with the show, helps the show grow. And uh, you've been doing it. And so uh, thank you very much every time we see it. And, uh, you know, we really appreciate it. The Mike on Much podcast is produced by Max Kerman, and I am your host, Mike Kerman. See you next week if we don't die on the weekend.